Welcome everybody that's here in the room, and we'd like to welcome those that are watching online. This is Uncharted. It's a weekly Bible study that we do at Emmanuel Baptist Church here in Billings, Montana. And um, so uh, we would encourage you to tell others about it as well. And uh, Pastor Paul is gone again this week. He'll be back next week and uh, picking back up with the study. But today, uh, we're going to be kind of piggybacking off what we talked about last week. Of course, you remember the series that we've started so far, we talked about the invisible God, and then we talked about the war in heaven, and then we talked about the, uh, the names of Satan, and really how the names of Satan really show his true character as we sit there and we think about his names. And uh, the most important thing from last week that you need to remember is that Jeff means kingly or peace of God. So that was really the thing that I wanted you guys to uh, really kind of hold on to. Hopefully you wrote that down. All right. Last week then, we also talked about uh, Cain and Abel. We talked about how the war came to earth. Uh, Pastor Paul has mentioned this a couple times, that the physical world cannot affect the spiritual world, but the spiritual world always affects the physical world. So we would understand when Satan lifted up in pride that we find in in Isaiah and other passages of Scripture, where he was lifted up in pride, he wanted to be like the Most High, he wanted to be God, he rebelled against the Lord, that he was cast out of heaven. And he was cast out of heaven to this earth. And in doing so, you would understand that there is this vindictive hatred by Satan for the things of God. I mean, there is, there is no love whatsoever from Satan to God. As we sit here and we look at this, then we can understand and see why Satan, then the first chance he had, he attacked God's creation. Okay? So when he went in, and we understand last week as we were looking in Genesis chapter 3 and in Genesis chapter 4, we see how the fall happened, how Satan came in and he tempted Eve, and then Adam sinned as well, not by ignorance, but the Bible clearly tells us that the Lord says, Adam, because you listened to your wife and not the command of God or my command, you have sinned. So it was disobedience. The Bible tells us in other passages that we looked at last week that for by one man's disobedience, sin came into the world and death by sin. So death passed upon all men for that all have sinned. But then it goes on and says, but by the obedience of one, many were made righteous. And we were talking about that second Adam Jesus Christ and what it was that he did. And we see this correlation between the first Adam and the second Adam where one disobeyed, but one obeyed. And as we sit here and we we continue in this story, in this study, we saw that even in Genesis chapter four, when it came that first opportunity of what, or let me say this, the first recorded uh, message about worship We see that Abel brought a sacrifice and Cain brought a sacrifice, okay? The issue was, why was Abel's accepted and Cain's wasn't? It was because of a heart issue. It could be because of his motives were wrong. But ultimately, our motives and everything, as we're going to see here in a little bit, our desires, everything come out of our heart. So we know ultimately... Cain's issue was a heart issue. In Hebrews, in chapter 11, the Bible gives us even more clarification, and it tells us that uh, Abel's sacrifice was accepted because it was of faith, where where Cain's was not. So we understand here that it was a heart issue, but it was also, as we would understand, a faith issue. 
We know that the sacrifices and the worships, and if it was the firstborn sacrifice, which was a sacrifice for, uh, to redeem the firstborn, it was, a, it was a, a past picture of what the Lord would do eventually when we see in, uh, in the children of Israel, when they leave Egypt, and we see how there is that redeeming of the firstborn. And as we look at this, we can see that ultimately it's a faith issue. That's basically what it comes down to for you and I today. You know, that hasn't changed at all, other than the fact that we don't do sacrifices. We don't sacrifice lambs or bulls or goats or pigeons, or we don't necessarily bring uh, uh, vegetables to, to bring sacrifice. Now, occasionally in the church office, someone drops off a plate of cookies. You can bring that anytime <laughs> you want. I know it's not an offering. I know it's not a sacrifice, but I just wanted to be clear on that. If you want to bring a vegetable, that's fine. Someone will eat it. But <laughs> cookies, cakes, anything like cinnamon rolls, anything like that? Okay. But the fact is, when we look at how this has not changed at all, we see also that yours and I, mine, that's not very good English, but our worship is all about faith. It's all about faith. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God the Bible tells us in Hebrews. It's through faith that we accept Christ. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Faith permeates yours and my worship to the Lord and how it is that we live our life. So we would understand then that faith, as we see in Cain and Abel through their Uh, through their sacrifices, how one was accepted and one wasn't. It was through a faith issue. It wasn't that God didn't like Cain because the Lord told Cain. He said, Cain, if you do well, then you'll be accepted. What was he saying? He was saying, Cain, if you get your heart right, if you do the sacrifice by faith, if you have faith, you will be accepted as well. Now, As we move from that, I want to look specifically, and you can take your Bibles and maybe you already have it opened up, to 1 John chapter 2. In 1 John chapter 2, the Bible talks to us about temptations, about desires, about the heart, about being tempted. And this is one of the passages that we look at where we can see how it is that Satan works in your life and my life. You know, the interesting thing is that as Satan works in your life with his desires, um, and we're going to be looking here. Let's just go to the past. Let's just go to the book, to the Bible here, and let's read it. John chapter, 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 15. The Bible says this, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh... And the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whosoever does the will of God abides forever. So when we look at this passage of Scripture, what it's going to do is it's going to open up to us and help us to understand the workings of Satan, not just in the Garden of Eden, not just with Cain, not just with every other human being that's ever lived on this earth, we'll see that that his ploy or what it is that he institutes in your life and my life is the exact same that he's always used. Now, when it came to this first time, let's look back at verse 15. The Bible says here, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. When we sit here and we think about temptation, uh, Webster's Dictionary says this, that temptation is the desire to do something, especially something that is wrong or unwise. Okay. Now, when you think about that, temptation, it's the desire to do something, I think I understand what he's talking about, but I think the scripture gives us a better uh, definition of really being tempted. Now, we think of temptation of what is, and then moving to the action part of it about somebody being tempted. 
It rather, it says this, that being tempted is being enticed to do something wrong. Okay, so when we sit here and we think about this, and I'm going to go a direction on this, because in James, in chapter 1, 13 through 15, let me just read this to you. The Bible says this, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desires. All right, so we see here that being tempted is the enticement to do something wrong, okay? Maybe you've heard someone say, temptation isn't sin, but what you do with the temptation is sin. And where they get that from is where the scripture talks about how Jesus was tempted in all points like as you and I are, yet without sin. So when we sit here and we look at what being tempted or the action of being tempted is, it is that being enticed to do something wrong. The action of doing wrong hasn't happened yet. It is that being tempted. So when, the, uh, when we sit here and we read about Jesus Christ being tempted, and we'll look at that a little bit later, we know that Jesus Christ was sinless. We know that he did not sin. And the Bible tells us that, that he was tempted in all points like as you and I are, yet without sin. So when we sit here and we think about the temptation and what James 1 says is that temptations is when we act upon it. He says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and desired by his own desires. Well, I think you're right off the bat in verse 15 where the scripture tells us to love not the world. You see, that's the title of your, your, on your paper there where your, where your opportunity to write some notes are is that. Because love not the world would, in, would then tell us that we are supposed to love something else, right? Well, we know that man or mankind is designed to love. We're designed to love and we're designed to be loved, okay? We would understand that uh, when Adam and Eve were created in the garden, there was that perfect fellowship. There was that, there was that love of, that we know of God toward his creation, Okay, so we would understand and assume that that would be reciprocal, that Adam and Eve then in turn loved God. Before sin entered into the world, that's what it would have been, this perfect fellowship, this perfect relationship. So what happens is when the Bible here specifically tells us in verse 15 that you and I are not supposed to love the world, but we're supposed to love the Father, the interesting fact here is that you and I can't love God and love the world at the same time. We can't do it. I can't ride the fence. I can't be gray in this area. It's either I'm loving God, my desires are toward God, or I'm loving the world and my desires are towards the world. Okay? So when you and I think about temptation or sin, specifically in your life, because you know the difficulties that you have in your life, when it comes up and you are enticed, you are tempted to do something wrong, you're enticed by the desires of your heart, you are getting ready to make a decision. And the decision is this, am I going to turn from that enticement? Am I going to turn from temptation and love God? Or am I going to give in to that temptation and love the world? Now, I wish that for you and for me, we would always make that decision. God, I'm going to love you. I wish I did that every single time. But I don't. But in that moment, I have chosen the world over God. And so what we see here in the scriptures, it tells us right off the bat that you are not supposed to love the world. We're not supposed to love the world, but we're supposed to love God. Because if someone then loves the world, as it says in verse 15, the love of the Father is not in him. When we sit here and we think about the world, we've got to understand what the Bible is talking about, about the world. In the scriptures, world is used three different ways. One is talked about creation, okay? Now, the scripture tells us here that, it, I don't believe that the Bible here is telling us that we're not supposed to love the physical creation, okay? Uh, Romans chapter 1 tells us that. Romans chapter 1 tells us that, that everything uh, that it was created by the Lord, it was created for a specific purpose, and that specific purpose was to 
help other people or help all people and help them to realize about God's eternal Godhead, okay? It was there for a specific purpose, okay? It was never designed to be worshiped, okay? The continuation of Romans chapter one goes in and tells us what happens when someone does that, when they, when they, when they serve the world, when they worship the creation, the Bible talks about that being idolatry. Uh, there's some great passage in the scripture. Uh, in Isaiah, he talks about, he's talking to the, the children of Israel, and he's, he's, he's um, telling them about their idolatry, and he just doesn't understand it because what they do is they go and they, they cut down a tree, and with that tree, they'll make boards, and they'll, they'll build some things on their houses, then they'll take some of the excess wood, and they'll build a fire with it, and then that which is left, the, the leftovers that's not useful for building or anything like that, they'll take that, and they'll carve that into an image, and they'll worship it, and the Lord says, that doesn't even make sense that you take the leftovers, and this is what you worship. So what happens is when you and I, and we love the fact of living in Montana, don't we? Other than the wind. <laughs> the wind is something, I know it has value. And, um, but we love looking. We love, driving, we love driving west and seeing the mountains. We love driving, maybe you love driving east and you're seeing the prairies. You love driving through central Montana and seeing all the refineries, you know, <laughs> But Montana is a beautiful place. But do you know that God's never designed the mountains or the forest or the plains to be worshipped? But rather, maybe like you have done the same as I have, when I'm driving west and I see the mountain, I say, wow, Lord, I just can't believe how you created those things. Man, they are just, they are beautiful. Or a nice fall day when we actually have fall in Montana. And you see the leaves, and it's cool, and the leaves are starting to change, and it's just, it's just the beauty in it. It was never designed to be worshipped. So we understand here in verse 15 that he's not talking about creation. Uh, the world is used another way, and it's used for uh, mankind, for humans, okay, for God's creation. That's not what the Bible's talking about here, because many other times God tells us that you and I are supposed to love our neighbors, that we are supposed to love people, that we are supposed to show God's love to others as well. So we are supposed to, to love them and have a desire for them to understand who Christ is. The same way that someone had a desire to tell you about Christ and give you the opportunity to accept Christ. And you did that. Now you had that opportunity to take what you have learned and what you know and share with others because you love them. So the Bible here in verse chapter uh, second, first John chapter 15 would not be telling us, or chapter two, verse 15 would not be telling us to do not love mankind. That's what he's talking about. So what is this other world that he is talking about in this world? What well, in the word here that we see, and it is this, it's love, not the world or the world system. Okay. And the world system, or we could say it this way, the spiritual system of evil. Let me read a passage of scripture for you in Ephesians in chapter 2. Ephesians in chapter 2, and in verse 1 through 3, the Bible says this, And you were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you, wa in which you once walked, Following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind." We see here in verse 2, the Bible tells, talks about this, how you and I once walked following the course of this world, the prince of the power of air. Who is it he's talking about there? He's talking about Satan. So when we understand when the Bible says here, love not the world, what he's saying is this, love not this world system. Love not the evil that we find in the world. Love not the world that... That every desire that it has is contrary to God. That's why he starts out right at the beginning. You can only love one or two people. You can only love one or two things. You either love God or you love the world. So when we think of temptation or we think of being 
tempted, here the Bible goes on and tells us what then are these segments of the world system that you and I are not supposed to love, okay? Well, starting in verse 16 and verse 17 of of 1 John chapter 2, it says this, for all that is in the world, the world system, for all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Okay, so we could say it this way. It's not from the world, it is from Satan. Because the evil that we find in the world originated with Satan. Okay, so here he tells us, and I love how, I like how the King James says this, because I think it gives a little bit more force to it. It says this, it says, love not the world as we see there. Let me read it for you, verse 16. It says, for all that is in the world, and the, and the King James says this, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Desires, sometimes we understand what that is. Desires are things that we, that, oh yeah, that's something I would like to do. That's my, my heart's desire is to do this, or my heart's desire is to do that. But when you put in the word lust there, it gives this forcefulness to us. It's this longing. This is what I want to do with my life. This is, this is where my heart wants to go. And that's what lust means. And so when we sit here and we think about this, we think about this passage, what is in the world? What is this evil system? What is it that has come from Satan? It is the desire or the lust of the flesh. What is that? As we sit here and we think of the desires of the flesh, our base sinful desires of heart are are perverted by all other desires. Okay, now... The Bible tells us in verse uh, in Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9 that the heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And you and I would understand that. Well, I hope we would understand that. Many a times we have been beaten by our own heart. We're enticed to do something wrong. We're tempted. We're enticed. My heart says, oh, I want to do that. But then the Spirit says, no, you need to follow the Lord. You need to love God. And you think, well, I'm just following my heart. That's a bad thing to do. If you ever say that, if you ever say, I'm just following my heart, you're probably going the wrong way. Because what happens is, is that your heart and my heart are contrary. I am a, I am a sinful person. So my heart desires, if they are not in tune with the Spirit of the Lord, I guarantee you will send me the wrong way. And I will make the wrong decision every time. So the Bible tells us here, and it helps us to understand that these base sinful desires or the desires of the heart are perverted. Okay? It's because our heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Romans chapter 8 and verse 6 and 7 says this. It says, For to set the mind on the flesh is death. For the mind that is set on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Now, we can interchange mind and heart in that. Um, Mark chapter 7 and verse uh, 20 through 23 um, has a great passage on this. The the Lord is there with his disciples, and um, the Pharisees and Sadducees, they come up and they, they, they... really kind of test the Lord. They said, they said, what is wrong with your apostles? Uh, they're eating food without washed hands. Now, this passage is the favorite passage for every boy from age five till, you know, however, you know, however long. And the Lord said, <laughs> 70, is that what it was? And the Lord says this, the disciples say, Lord, they said, nobody, why are your disciples not eating? Why are they not washing their hands before they eat? And the Lord kind of scolds them and says, don't you know that that which cometh into the man doesn't defile him because it comes into the stomach and then goes out through the draught, purifying? But he says, it's that which cometh out of the heart. Okay? So, as we sit and we look at this, not that which cometh into the man that defileth him, but it's that which cometh out of the heart that defileth him. Okay? So what comes out of the heart? Our sinful desires our sinful desires that are contrary to God. That's why you and I must be yielded to the Spirit in our life because I can't trust my heart. 
But as I yield to the Spirit, as I understand God's Word, as I read God's Word, I can be led by the Spirit, and we're gonna, we need to move on here as we continue. As we see here, we talked about the desires of flesh. Well, then it goes on, it says the desires of the eyes, or the lust of the eyes. And this kind of goes right back to Mark chapter 7, okay? Because remember, he said, that which cometh into the man defileth him, okay? It's not that which cometh into the man defileth him, but that which cometh out because it comes out of his heart, okay? How, are, how do things get into our heart? There's two ways. Our ear gates and our eye gates. So what happens is this. You've heard this story, garbage in, garbage out, right? You've heard that phrase before. Well, if I allow my eyes, and here we're talking specifically, he says, the lust of the eyes or the desires of the eyes. Remember, the desire of the eyes, these are all part of that world system. I can't trust my heart. So what happens is this. I have to be very careful what I allow myself to hear, and I need to be very careful what I allow myself to see. Because when I hear things that are contrary to God, that goes right in and it affects my heart. When I look on things that I should not look at, it goes right in and it affects my heart. So Mark chapter 7 could be saying this, okay? It's not that which cometh into the man, the food, the physical, what he was talking about with the washed hands, you know. He says, let's take that, let's not look at it physically, but let's look at it spiritually. What are you allowing to come into your heart? Because out of the heart are the issues of life. Out of the heart are the desires. And we've already found out that you and I can't trust our heart. Well, let's look here at a couple of the things. Let me tell you a couple of the stories that you would understand why it's wrong and for us to be careful of what we allow in our eyes. We all remember the story in Genesis in chapter 19. God's bringing destruction on Sodom and Gomorrah. God comes with, uh, Jesus comes, I believe, as a Christophany. He comes, and he has two other angels with him. He's there. He's spending time with Abraham. And, uh, and then Jesus sends these two angels down to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy it. We know there was this bartering going on. Uh, Abraham f- knew that God was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But the problem was that his nephew Lot lived in Sodom. Well, he didn't want to see his nephew die. So he goes off and he says, he says, Lord, he said, would you spare the city if there were 50 righteous? And the Lord said, yeah, I'll spare the city if there's 50 righteous. And then he goes on, he says, Lord, would you spare the city if there were 40 righteous? Yeah, yeah, I would do 40. And then he's like, well, he said, don't be mad at me, Lord, don't be mad. Would you spare the city if there were 20 righteous? And, uh. Yes, I would spare the city if there was 20 righteous. He goes on back and forth with his bartering. He gets all the way down and he says, let the Lord not be mad at me, but would you save it if there were five righteous? And he said, yes, I would save if there was five. And we know that there was not five. He sends them down, sends the angels down. They destroy Or they go to get Lot and his family out. Lot, his wife and his three daughters, or two daughters, they go to get them out. Okay, okay, that would help you to understand. Remember how many, what did he say if there was five righteous? He would say if there was five. He had Lot, his wife, and his two daughters. If just one of them would have given the gospel, if one of them would have told somebody and helped them to become a believer in God, a whole city would have been saved. But they didn't do that. Angels go down, they get Lot, they had to drag him out. There's a whole story that goes in with that. They drag him out, they drive the wife out, and they drive the girls out, and they're running, and the angel said, run for your life, run to the hills. Whatever you do, don't look back. And what happened in Genesis chapter 19? They were running, Lot's wife, because the desires of her heart, the desire of Sodom and Gomorrah, the desires of her friends, the desires of the world, she looked back. And instantly she turned into a pillar of salt. As we sit here, we need to be careful of what we allow our eyes to look at. Was there anything sinful about looking back at Sodom and Gomorrah? Yes, because God told them not to. Okay, let's look at another one here. Joshua's chapter 7 and verse 18 through 22. The Israelites have just come out of, uh, they just went into um, 
across the Canaan land, or excuse me, across the Jordan River, and they're getting ready to go into Jericho. Now, they have already been wandering in the wilderness for 40 years, and man, they are excited. They're going to go in. They're crossing the Jordan. They've already sent two spies in, and the people of Jericho there, they found out that, man, they were afraid of them. So they go in to Jericho, and, and as the Lord told Joshua, this is what I want you to do. We know the story. They were going to march around six times, or seven times on the seventh time. They were going to blow their trumpets, and the walls were going to fall in. But God told him, he said, this is what I want you to tell the people. I want them to know that everything in Jericho is sacred. Everything in Jericho is, they use the term accursed, meaning this, it's mine. It's for me. You can't go in. Every other nation that you go in, you destroy a city, you can take the plunder. You can do all of those things. So he said, okay. So he tells the people. They go into Jericho, and there was a man named Achan. Achan went in. He was one of the soldiers. He went in, and the Bible says that he looked upon some Babylonian garments. He saw them. He knew the command of God. He chose to love his, his earthly or his heart desires, and he took of the clothes, Babylonian clothes, he took of some gold and he took some jewels. And he sat there and then nobody knew about it. Nobody knew about it. They go against Ai. They go against AI. AI is just this little city. They go there and they get defeated. They get whooped. They had to run away with their tails between their legs. I mean, they got, and Joshua was like, Lord, what's going on? We just, we just destroyed Jericho, this huge city, and now we lose against AI. And the Lord tells Joshua, he says, Joshua, get up off your face. He says, they're sitting in the camp. So they go through and they find out, they go by lots and um, they find out who it was. It comes down to Achan. And Joshua says, Achan, what did you do? And Achan said, when I saw the Babylonian garments, the wedge of gold, the jewels, I took them. You and I need to be careful what we allow our eyes, how we allow our eyes to affect our heart and our heart's desires to affect our eyes. Let me give you one more, a very familiar one. Second Samuel chapter 11 and verses 1 through 5. David's king. He's going out. Everybody's going out to battle. The Bible says it's specifically a time when the kings go out to war or the kings go out and they go out to battle. But David decided to stay at the palace. And he went up, and man, it was a beautiful morning. He gets up in the morning, and he sees the sunrise. Maybe he goes out to worship the Lord and worship uh, and just say, Lord, well, Lord, just such a great day. Wow, and he gets up there, and the Bible says that he spotted Bathsheba. Well, the Bible says this, that he turned and looked. It's one of those things where it's like, oh, hmm. And he looked again. He allowed his eyes and what he saw to affect his heart. And out of his heart came what? Lies, murder, deceit, all because he allowed his eyes to look on something. You and I, the Bible tells us here, what are the aspects of the world system or the spiritual evil in this world that Satan has spun and started getting it going and as we sit and we look at that, what, first of all, is the lust of the flesh. What is that you and I desire to do? What it is that we want in our life? Whether it is covetousness, man, I want that. Whether it is um, addiction to something, man, I want that. That makes me feel good. That's what the lust of the flesh is. That makes me feel good. The Bible says it's the lust of the eyes. That you and I must be very careful because it's through our eyes and through our ears that what we see and what we hear allows to affect our heart. As we sit here and we think about this and we look at the desires or the lust of the eyes, there's one more, and the Bible says this, the pride of life. Now, I used earlier Romans chapter 1, verses 21 through 23, and that's really the passage that goes about this because the pride of life, let's just go to it, let me read it for you real quick here. Romans chapter 1, and in verse 21 through 23, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals 
and creeping things. Here in verse 22, the Bible says they were claiming themselves to be wise, but they came, became fools. What is it that we think of the pride of life itself? We find other times where the pride of life is, is what it is that we want. We want to be seen of men. We want to do things. And this is where when it comes to even our work in the ministry or what it is that you and I do to serve the Lord, are you doing it for God's honor or are you doing it to be seen of men? Are you working in the nursery? Are you teaching a class? Are you leading a Bible study? Are you helping and serving in some place in, in, uh, in, in God's ministry or God's work that we find in this world? Are you doing it for yourself or are you doing it for the Lord? Because what happens is this. The pride of life means this. What that wants is this. I want to be seen. I want to be seen of people. I want them to see. It's like I'm going to do this over here in secret so nobody can see me but I'm going to make some noise so somebody looks over. Oh, and then they see me serving. What is that? That's to be seen of men. So what happens is the Bible tells us here the pride of life is really nothing more than desiring your own will over God's will for your life. The pride of life is this, is what we talked about with Cain and Abel. Cain desired, and he was upset. He could have done right. He could have got his heart right. He could have done it by faith. But instead, he welled up in pride. He was, he was, he was bitter against Abel. He was prideful in his life. I'm not going to change that. What I have brought God is good enough. That's literally what he was showing. What I have done is good enough. It's prideful. And the Bible tells us here that you and I, this is how Satan works. Now, remember, it tells us to love not the world, okay? So we always have a decision. When we are tempted, when we are enticed to do something wrong, at that moment you have a decision. Am I going to love the world? Am I going to love God? Well, what is it that Satan uses to try to draw you away from God, from the love of God? What is it he draws you away from? And what is it that he uses to work in your life and my life so many times? It's the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. In your areas, now we look at those, those would be like what we would understand as the main points. But underneath that, we have all these different things because there are specific things that under maybe the lust of the flesh that you are tempted by that I'm not tempted by. Okay? Or the lust of the eyes or the lust or the pride of life. So we understand that all temptations will find their root in one of these Three desires, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, the pride of life. This will help you. When it comes time and uh, you're being enticed and you know it, we, we understand. We know when we're being enticed. We know when we're being tempted. You can come to the point you say, okay, Lord, I don't want to do this. Where is this coming from? Is this, is this the desire of my eyes? Is this the lust of my eyes? Is this the pride of life, Lord? Why would I want to do that? When we think about that, it helps us to understand that, wait a minute, this whole thing is wrong but rather I'm going to follow the Lord. So all these temptations work. Let's look here first. When Satan had his first opportunity, we know, as we mentioned earlier, when Satan fell from heaven, when he sinned against God, it was pride, okay? And really, we can put all of those together, okay? But Satan didn't have flesh. He's an angel. He's a, he's a created being, okay? But he desired to be like God. That's what he wanted in his life. The, the, the lust of the eyes. I want to be like him. I want to sit on the high mountain. I want to sit on the throne. And then we have the pride of life where he was like, this is what I want to do. I should be. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest created. I should be the one that is sitting on the throne. So we see here that Satan started this. We see in Genesis chapter 3, Jesus used, or excuse me, Satan used the exact same things. Do you remember the story of Adam and Eve? What was, let's go back to Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis in chapter 3, let's go, let me go back here. Genesis chapter 3, let's start in verse 1. Okay. Now the serpent was more subtle or more crafty than any other beast of the field, and the Lord God that the Lord of God had made. And he said to the woman, Did did God actually say you shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the tree of the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall ye touch it, lest you die. 
But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Remember, this is the first time that we have, it's not even, it's not just the first recorded, it is the first time that humankind is tempted to sin. So Satan's like, man, I got to bring my best. I got to, I got to, man, I got to hit him with all three barrels. Because the Bible goes on and she says this in verse six. So when this, so when the woman, what? Saul, her eyes, that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes. Or maybe she saw, and that's what she, her flesh wanted, excuse me, her flesh wanted it, that it was good for food and that, the, that it was delight to her eyes, that lust of the eyes, that desire of, of the eyes, and that the tree was to desire to make one wise, the pride of life. What did she do? She took of its fruit. And ate it, and also gave some to her husband that was with her, and he ate it. And both their eyes were opened. We see here in Genesis chapter 3, Satan, when he has his first opportunity, he comes at them with the best that he has. He doesn't pick one little specific thing, but he says, I'm going I'm to talk to you about this fruit. I'm going to talk to you about what it looks like. I'm going to tell you that you know that God, you know that God just lied to you. You know he doesn't want you to, to know those things. He knows, you know, what's wrong with that fruit? It looks like, it's, man, look how pretty that fruit is. And what happens is this, the Bible tells us and gives us insight to how she, how her tempting came to her, how she was enticed by, what, by her actions and what she did. She looked at it and she said, boy, my flesh wants that. She looked at it and said, boy, that's really appealing to me in my eyes. And then, boy, I see that it, boy, if Satan, if you're telling the truth, and if I eat of that, I'm not really going to die, but, man, I'm going to be really smart. I'm going to be wise. So at that moment, Eve decided, I'm going to love the world and not God. She then took that fruit, gave it to Adam, told Adam about it. Look, Adam, I ate of the fruit, but there's nothing. I'm still alive, see? I'm still here. I didn't die. Adam knew the commandment, but he listened to his wife, and he took of it as well. And sin entered the world. When we think of these when Satan used all three of these, dealing with Eve, he gave the best he could. Matthew chapter 4, we see the next time that Satan specifically comes up and he's going to tempt somebody. It's the temptation of Jesus Christ that we find in Genesis, or excuse me, in Matthew in chapter 4. In Matthew chapter 4, we find that Satan, when he comes to Christ, he knows that he has to give the best he can. He has to give the best um, uh, temptation and uh, boy, just boy, this is Christ. This is the Creator. Remember Satan. That's how he. That's how he responded to who God was in Matthew and chapter four. We see here when we talk about the the temptation of Jesus Christ. We see that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness in verse one to be tempted by the devil. Okay. Now remember, we read earlier in James chapter one that God cannot be tempted, nor tempteth he any man. Well, remember what tempting is. Tempting or temptation is this enticement to do wrong. Okay? So, Satan came to talk with Jesus and to try to entice him to make a wrong decision and to do wrong. Well, what were the things that Satan spoke to him about? As we look at it, the Bible says here in verse 3 that the tempter came, one of Satan's names. And if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Now remember, Jesus, he's in the wilderness. He hasn't eaten for 40 days. 40 days. Man, I ate pretty good this morning, and I'm hungry again. (laughs) 40 days. So he is hungered. Remember, Jesus suffered in all points like as we are. The Bible says that he suffered hunger. He suffered thirst. He was was 100% God and 100% man. Meaning this, that when you and I get tired, the Lord got tired. When he, we, we get hungry, the Lord got hungry. When we got thirsty, when we got 
emotional when we got when we when we cry the lord cried the bible tells multiple occasions that the lord uh, cried and that he had sorrow for the people looking out over the city we know that when it came to lazarus it was the he was concerned he, he was he the bible says that he wept not over lazarus but over the sorrow that it was bringing lazarus's family here so we find that the lord is hungry he is he is i mean he's ready uh, for that next meal, if we could say it that way. But Satan came to him, and we see here in verse 4, remember we talked about the tempter came to him and said, hey, if you are the Son of God, if you're really the Redeemer, remember the Son of God, remember how, how it was in Genesis in chapter 3, how it was that Satan, what he called the Lord, or what he called Jesus, he didn't call him the Redeemer or Lord God, he just said God, and it was the word Elohim for Creator. Remember, Satan doesn't know God as the Redeemer. He can't. He knows him as the creator. So he comes up to him and says, if you're really the son of God, if you're really the redeemer, if you're really the one, then turn these stones into bread, the lust of the flesh. Jesus was hungered. He comes at him with that. The Lord responds and says, it is written, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. Verse 5, then the devil then took him to the holy city and sent him on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, if you truly are the son of God, if you are the redeemer, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And on, and on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. As we sit here and we look at that, he already, he already tested him or tempted him for the lust of the flesh. Here he is, he tells him, and we get this understanding of this, this, uh, this lust of the eyes or the desires of the eyes to knowing that he will be taken care of, that, that, he is in, that he's important, that he'll be taken care of, and the angels will come, and they will save him, and they will take care of him. They'll, they'll catch you. It's, it's, this, it's this thought of, of this, this looking forward or this looking unto something other than God, because remember, he knew that this was Satan. He knew that this was a temptation. And what was it that Satan said to him? Oh, excuse me, what was it that Jesus said to him? In Jesus, verse 7, and again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to test, or you shall not tempt him. In verse 8, again the devil took him to a very high mountain and just showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory. And he said to him, all of these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. He comes after the Lord with the pride of life. I'll give you all of these things. You can have all the riches. You can have all the notoriety. You can have everything. I'll give it all to you. And the Lord told him this. He says in verse 10, Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered unto him. Mark Driscoll, who is a pastor in uh, Arizona, Scottsdale, Arizona, uh, he said this, speaking specifically about uh, the temptations of Satan that he does in our life, and he kind of made it really poignant to uh, our day and age. And he said this, in our age, filled with advertising, rock stars, supermodels, and celebrities, it is not an overstatement to say that the worldliness that if worldliness means living only to please our flesh and pursue with our eyes to lust after so that we can arrogantly boast about our conquests and our accomplishments, then worldliness is a synonym for America. When we sit here and we think and we look at our day and age, I want you to understand it is no different spiritual wise through the temptations or through the tempting of Satan than it was all the way back here with Adam and Eve. Right. Satan is using the exact same tactic all the way through. And you know why? Because Satan hates you. He hates you. He hates you because if you've accepted Jesus Christ in your heart and to save you because you're a child of God. 
If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want you to know that Satan hates you and he's going to do everything he can to keep you from accepting Christ as your Savior. As we sit here and we look at this, so what is it? We've got to get to this real quick. I've got four minutes. Let's get to how is it then do we combat temptation? All right, number one, to combat the lust of the flesh, and we talk about these three things, to combat the lust of the flesh, then you and I must walk in the Spirit. Galatians in chapter 5. Let me read this for you. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 16. The Bible says this, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things that you want to. To do. Remember, Paul says that. Paul speaks and he says this. He says, man, he says, he says, I'm just, he says, the thing that I want to do, the things that I know that are right to do, I don't do it. And the things that I don't want to do, the things I know that are sinful, those are the things that I do. And he says, oh, wretched man that I am. It's this struggle, it's this battle that you and I face on a daily basis is these desires and these lusts. Well, how is it that you and I combat this? The Bible's very clear here, and it's you and I walking in the Spirit. What does that mean? Being yielded to the Spirit. Being yielded and allow the Holy Spirit to work in your life. Do you know what it is that is hindering the Spirit's work in your life, in my life? You and me. I am the only thing that is hindering the Holy Spirit's work in my life. And so what happens is this, I can't be mad at anybody else. I can't be like Adam and say, Eve made me do it. You can't be like Eve and say, the serpent made me do it. I look at me and I say, oh, wretched man that I am. God, would you forgive me? And so what happens is here, how is it that we combat this lust of the flesh, the desires in my heart that says, boy, I want this for my life. It'll feel good. This is what I want. I have to walk in the spirit. And give my life to the Lord. We continue on reading in this passage. Where's in verse 20? In verse 19, now the works of the flesh are evident. Their sexual immorality, their impurity, their sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and these like and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, long-suffering, gentleness, self-control. Against such there things there is no law. So how is it that we combat the lust of the flesh? You and I need to be yielded to the Spirit. All right? Allow the Spirit to lead you. Number two. Number two. Boy, that took three minutes. I got two minutes. Here we go. Number two. To combat the lust of the eyes, we must ask God to turn our eyes. I love, go to Psalm chapter 71. You don't have to go there. I'll just read it for you. Psalm chapter 119, verses 33 through 37. David here, the psalmist, is is, uh, speaking. And I want you to listen to what he says. I'll read it real quick. Teach me, O Lord, the way of the statutes, and I will keep it to the end. Give me understanding that I may keep your law and observe it with my whole heart. Lead me in the path of your commandments, for I delight in it. Incline my heart to your testimonies and not to selfish gain. Turn my eyes from looking at worthless things and give me life in your ways. We looked at these verses here. Everything that the psalmist says, it wasn't anything that he said, Lord, he said, I'm going to do this and then you do this. No, no, it was like, God, you need to do this. You need to incline my heart. You need that first part is walking by the spirit. God, I need you to do this in my life. God, I don't want to go down that direction anymore. I always want to choose you. God, would you help me? Would you help me as I spend time in your word to understand and to, and to grow in my relationship? Help me to walk in the spirit. And then he throws right at the end there. He says, and turn my eyes so I don't look on worthless things. You know, if you and I don't look at work, I'm not saying we walk around with a bag on our head. We can't do that. But what I'm saying is this, is that we don't give in to the enticement of whether it is something our eyes, when we see something our eyes shouldn't look at. Many times we, we think about, uh, when we talk about the lust of, of the eyes, we talk about something that's immoral. And, and though that's a part of it, but it's the lust of our eyes that brings covetousness into our heart. And so what happens is we need to be careful of what we allow our eyes to see. Okay, that's how we combat the lust or the, the lust of the eyes 
is to ask God to help turn your eyes. You can't be pure of heart and mind without the Lord's help. Lastly, hang with me. Lastly, number three, to combat the pride of life, one must remain humble. The exact opposite of pride is humility. Now, this is a tough one because you can't go around and say, I'm humble. <laughs> you just can't do that. And, uh, but true, hum- true humility is a reliance upon God and who he is. Let's look at a couple verses and we're done. James chapter four, verses six through eight, the Bible says this. Therefore it says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he'll flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. What is it the Bible tells us here? That he resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. How is it that I can be a humble person? I submit myself to God, and I resist the devil. I submit myself to God. What is that? That's saying you and I are making that decision. I'm resisting the enticements, the enticements of the temptation of the devil, and I'm loving God. How is it that you and I can combat the pride of life? We are humble by submitting ourselves to God. Last verse, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 23. The Bible says this, Once pride will bring him low, but, but he who is lowly in spirit will obtain honor. You and I, yes, we are sinful people. We are sinners saved by grace. If you have given your life to the Lord, if you have repented of your sin and accept, accepted Jesus Christ, come in your heart and to save you, you are a child of God, but you are a sinner saved by grace. You and I will continue to battle sin until Jesus comes back where the Lord calls us home. It's a fact of life. Sin in your life and my life should not surprise us. I should wake up every morning and be like, okay, Lord, you know what's going to happen today. I want to choose you. And we should get up in the morning and we should submit ourselves to the Lord, be humble, ask God to turn our eyes to make sure that I don't look on anything or that I don't, that I don't look on something and then want it for myself. I don't look on something. Lord, would you guard my eyes? And Lord, please help me not to have the lust of the flesh. Help me always to choose you. Yeah. 